Hi everybody, uh, welcome to the comprehension questions for the uh, first nine chapters of The Girl of Ink and Stars. So obviously I have read those chapters to you on YouTube and you uh, might want to listen to them again, um, maybe pausing as you're going along when you're looking at the vocabulary and the, and the questions. I've only uh, written four-ish questions for each chapter um, because I would like you to think about these in quite a lot of detail. So. Uh, well, these are really the, the three mark sort of questions that we would be expecting in a comprehension paper. Um, so having a point that answers the question, possibly more than one point, um, and then backing that up with evidence from the text and then explaining uh, what you mean and why you've chosen that piece of evidence. So really explaining your answer fully so that you're answering the question properly. Um, so please don't rush through these. I want you to think really carefully about them. They are, some of them are quite challenging um, and I would like you to really think deeply and think about perhaps um, why am I have chosen that question, like why that part of the plot is significant because um, I have read on in the book so I do know what's coming. Um, some of these questions are going to be trying to provoke you to think about um, what your impressions are so far and what your predictions are and what kind of foreshadowing has been going on in the text. So um, think carefully about them. You can either upload your answers to Shobi directly by typing them in the comments boxes um, or you can write them out by hand and then take a photograph and send it to me um, or to Shona um, or whatever works for you really but you can definitely print these questions off. I will also um, upload a PDF to uh, Shobi um, so you can do them by hand to avoid spending too much time on the screen because that is really important just for your uh, general well-being. Um, so if you can do them off screen and write them, the answers out yourself, uh, that would be great. So uh, anyway, here we go. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see. And I should stay in the corner. So here we go. So questions one to nine. So first of all, I would like you to re-listen to or reread the chapter and write a sh short summary of what happens in the chapter. So that's key events, key characters that we're introduced to in this chapter um, and anything else that you think is significant. So things that you think might be contributing to foreshadowing or things that you are, the writer has um, included to in, for you to infer. Then the vocabulary for this chapter. Um, we've got ragged, perch, omen, chaffinch, goldcrest, mythical, yowled, basin, etched, conjure, braided, marooned, pigment, wondrous, incognito, unfavourable, banishing, territories, cartographer, heirloom, fragment and sap. Now, with vocabulary as ever, it is really important that if you already know the, the um, definition or if you look up the definition, that you don't just write down what it says in the dictionary because obviously in different contexts, different words mean different things, okay? So it's really important that you think about that quite carefully um, and that you do not jump in uh, and write down a definition that is actually incorrect. So make sure you listen really carefully to the section of the text or read it if you've got the book um, that this particular word is in and think about what it means in that context, okay? That's really important. The questions, chapter one. What has happened to many of the animals in Joya and what does this make you think? What does Isabella want to do more than anything else? And what impression does this give you of her personality? What was the purpose of the voice line in Isabella's room? Does she still use it? Explain your answer. What impression do you get of Da? Explain your answer using evidence from the text. Now, I don't want one word answers to these. I don't want really short answers. I want you to really think about not only answering the question, but also making a link between what you are thinking about when you're listening to the text. Because obviously we've talked about this before, good readers don't just read what they've, what's been written on the page. They read and they make connections and they think, and they're constantly thinking about what they already know, what they uh, predicted was gonna happen, the impressions that they've already got. So it's all about that really deep thinking about the story. Then on to chapter two, again, reread or re-listen write a short summary of what happens in the chapter. It's really important that you do this because it just gives you, uh, it, it gives you a chance to really think about what is important because obviously every chapter that a writer, an author writes has got key plot points and also um, subplot points in there. And then there's also going to be introduction of different characters. So different parts of description that are coming in. So something I, um, when I'm writing, often think about is, when am I going to introduce certain characters? So does, and that is, that's all planned out in books. Okay. So you don't get introduced to 
all of the characters at the beginning um, of a story in a big information dump. You um, have them sort of given ever so slightly in little clues being put in all the way through uh, until you're about halfway through a book and then generally you then know and you can move forward with the plot. So have a little, really focus on this. I know it sounds like a, a sort of simple task, but actually if you do it properly, it, it's, it requires quite a lot of thinking. The chapter, sorry, on this page is a few words that should be uh, on different lines. Shouldered, satchel, spokes, harbour, bottlenecked, moored, baobab, spanned and stowed are two different words. Um, ought, glinted, basalt, uphold, honour, barrel and awnings, also two different words. Orchard, tutted, de decade, propel, jerking, bounded, abandoned, done, stallions, silhouetted, plaits and sauntering. Um, the reason I'm reading this to you is because sometimes when they're written down, you might not necessarily have, heard, have seen that word written down before and read it phonetically differently to how it's actually pronounced. Okay, so that's why I'm doing this for you. Question two, question, chapter two questions rather. Um, would you like to live in a place controlled by Governor Adori? Why or why not? Again, I'd like a lot of detail in these answers, evidence in the text. I'm not interested in your opinion unless you can explain why you think it, of course. I say that all the time, I know, and just so that you haven't forgotten. Who is Luke and what is your impression of her? Explain your answer. What can you infer about the dead aloe? Explain your answer. What time period do you think the story is set in and give evidence to support your opinion? Now, I really like this question. It's one that comes up a lot in adult book clubs, um, if, um, which you can ask your uh, grown-ups about if they um, ever take part in book clubs. But sometimes a story, well, often a story doesn't say to you, it was the year, blah, blah, blah. It gives you clues that then you are allowed to, you can then deduce what time period a story is set in. So it might be what people are wearing, the way they behave, what they're saying, the resources that are available to them, how they move around, all those sorts of things. So have a little think, what time period do you think the story is set in? Sorry, that's what it is. Um, and think about the evidence that is there to support your answer. Now, obviously we've kind of, this is, it is a fictional world. So that's got that kind of dystopian element to it, which means that, um, it's a world with its own set of rules and jurisdictions um, and therefore it's not necessarily completely relatable to our world however if based on what you know of our world what time period would you have would you place it in okay for example a good a way of thinking about this is the Harry Potter books um, there's no technology used in any of them yeah so there's no mobile people don't have mobile phones they don't you know they've got base technology like TVs and stuff like that but they don't have the sort of technology that we have nowadays. So we know that they're set, um, you know, that little bit uh, further in the past, so in the 90s, um, which is not that long ago, but um, they don't have the same technology as we have now, okay? So those clues are there to help you uh, to work out the time period. Okay, chapter three, reread, re-listen, write a summary. Vocabulary. Annual, parade, motioned, interior, pursed, imposing, cramped, slatted, superstitious, tuneless, halt, scuff, parchment, curfew, spooling, wrenched, indignantly, tilted, tobaba, deserted, jutted, incomprehension. Okay, some great words in this book. Questions. The author paints a negative picture of the governor during this chapter. Now we've had some um, hints before this chapter but in this particular chapter I think it's very apparent so how does the author do this how does she do that paint that neg negative picture um, I think this is a really great example of really good character description um, in this chapter because she uses physical description so description of the governor's physicality to help convey something about his personality and I'd like you to think about how she does that um, and use examples from the text to explain your answer we meet Pablo in this chapter. What is your impression of him? Explain your answer. Isabella finds out that Cata is dead. What do you think is going through her mind at this point? And I want you to not just think about, oh, she feels sad or she'll feel um, upset or she'll feel angry. I want you to think about what is she going to be thinking? So what is going, what thoughts are going to be racing through her mind based on what she already knows, based on what she thinks might have happened, based on what she's heard already from somebody else? Um, those are the things that I want you to be thinking about. I want you to go back through and think about evidence for why she might be thinking certain things. Okay. Chapter four, re-listen, re-read. Summary, please. Flung, filtering, scolded, livestock, sullied, gouges, curtly embedded, lair, blurring, demon, oaths, sacrifice. Some really good vocab. 
We learn that there are scratch marks around the body that was found. Did this change your opinion about what might have happened? How or why? So when we first heard that Kata's body had been discovered, there was no evidence or um, description of what might have happened. So you might have drawn your own conclusions in your head there based on what you know about some of the other characters, for example, Governor Adori and his um, followers or guards. So the scratch marks, does that change your opinion? And if so, what does it, what does it do? What, what do you now think? Why do you think Dar gets angry with Isabella when she says someone needs to do something? I think this is a really interesting point in the story because um, I think there's a lot of sort of t mixed emotions and characters being torn between different opinions. So this is an example. So I want you to listen to that section of the story or reread that section of the story again um, and just think around it. Think about what other things that are going on and think about maybe things that have happened in the past um, and also his position as her father um, and you know, the situation they're in. Why do you think he gets angry with her? We get the impression that this isn't something that happens a lot. So why do, why do you think he does in this instance? Dari tells Isabella the myth of Arinta. Why do you think this is significant? Now, we talk, I talked a little bit about this in the video, um, that myths are not completely made up. They, t they have some basis in what people have at one point believed. Okay, so why is he retelling her the myth of Arinta? And what do you think is significant about that story that might be significant for this story as it unfolds? Okay, remember that authors never put things into, into books for no reason. Okay, they, they're, everything that they craft for you in a story is all there to help you build up this overall big picture. And that's what I want you to think about um, in that question. Isabella says, but you always say that you have to finish stories, even if they don't have happy endings. What can you infer from this or what does it make you think? And I think this is a really interesting quotation. So, but you always say you have to finish stories, even if they don't have happy endings. What does that make you think about the rest of this book? What does you, what kind of foreshadowing is going on here? What do you infer? Um, I thought that was a sort of turning point when I read this, I thought, oh, I have a slightly different opinion maybe about how this sort of story arc, the narrative curve of this book is going to go. Chapter five, re-listen, reread. Justice, jaggedly, fraying, settlement, flexed, scaling, muled, jolted, eerie, taffeta, gangly, abruptly, propel, persisted. Look them up, please. Definitions. Question five, um, chapter five questions. This is a quotation. The twist of worry was knotted through my body. I really like this piece of description. Um, what does it mean? Why do you think the author has used this description to describe her feelings? Because he, he's not actually just, she's not actually describing her feelings per se. She's describing again, some kind of physicality. So why does she do that? Um, and why is it effective? What does that particular description mean? Isabella's behaviour towards Luke changes dramatically in this chapter and why do you think it happens? Uh, what is your impression of Luke at this, uh, at this point in the story? Use evidence from the text to support your answer. I think Luke's a really interesting character to follow through this book because um, my opinion already, and we're only five chapters in, is that she's, she's going on a real character journey of sort of, you know, peaks and troughs of my opinion of hers changing constantly. So this, I want you to really think about that. Do you think Isabella was right to blame Luke for Cutter's death? Explain your answer in detail. And I want you to um, call on some of your debating skills with this. I want you to put yourself in the position of arguing for and against, because I want you to be able to really understand what you think. Um, and remember, I want you to um, be able to justify both sides. So whenever you explain what you think, if you're agreeing for, you can always start by discrediting the other argument. So although some people might think that blah, 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 I think that because, okay? So you start by uh, putting down or discrediting the, the other argument in order to enhance your own argument. Next one. Chapter six, smouldering, acrid, buckled, craned, manacles, grimace, whirly, latched, wincing, splintered, mournfully, coop. Okay, obviously I'm expecting you to be pausing this video throughout so that you can do bits and pieces or just using it as a guide. Uh, chapter six, do you think Pablo and the others were right to burn the governor's boat? Why or why not? It was Isabella's first time stepping in the sea. This is something that we know that she hadn't been able to do before and she'd been looking forward to, but explain your impression of her emotions at this point. I think this is quite an interesting um, 
piece of foreshadowing in terms of that, li that links quite nicely to that um, story is not always happy, having happy endings and things not always um, turning out as you may expect them to. Why did the guards arrest Masha, Pablo and Dar? Do you think this was fair? Explain your answer. How do you think Isabella feels when she gets Loop's note? Explain your answer in full. So this is what I mean about this sort of constant up and down of emotions and changing opinions of the different characters. Um, I think if you, my, my opinion has changed a lot throughout the book of these characters. And I think if you were to draw some kind of sort of story arc of um, your opinion about a character, like a graph of like how much you like them or how much you dislike them, um, it would definitely be going up and down um, in waves. Next one, summary. Wafting, hacking, mushrooming, discarded, bolted, shutters, quills, serrated, expedition, emitted, emerged, sneered, molten, ornately. You can see that the amount of vocabulary is going down because uh, the author tends to reuse vocabulary in this book. Um, that's quite common. So often you'll have to do more vocabulary work at the beginning of a book than you will further on uh, because there tends to be this repetition going on. So it's worth putting in the effort early on in the story. Another quotation, the threads of problems dangled in front of me and I tried to think of a way to weave them into a solution. Another brilliant quotation. What do you think this means? Okay, so think about the story, explain your answer. What do you think that quote, what does she mean, the author, when she says that? Um, or in the voice of Isabella, what is Isabella meaning when she says that? Why does Isabella disguise herself as a boy? Um, Isabella takes her father's cartography equipment with her. How do you think she feels about this expedition? Give two different answers with evidence from the text. Now, uh, I've put those, the fact that she takes her cartography, her father's cartography equipment with her um, in there for a reason, okay? So I want you to think about all that you know about Isabella, everything that she's said so far, everything that she's done so far, and now what she's about to do, okay? Because I very much think that she's got some mixed emotions going on here, and I'd like you to give two contrasting emotions um, that she feels about the expedition with good, valid pieces of evidence uh, from the story uh, to back yourself up. Isabella breaks into the governor's house, falls her through the window. Um, how has your opinion of her developed or changed since the beginning of the book? explain your answer in detail. This might be a great time for you to sort of map out that, as I was saying, that little graph of your opinion. Uh, Re-listen to or reread the chapter and write a short summary of what happens in the chapter. This is for chapter eight. Depicting gesture, exasperation, constricted, deigned, scrutinized, pompously, quipped, decisively, spooked, navigator, cripple, emboldened, lamely, tapestries, intersected, impenetrable, iridescent. The governor's daughter is missing. Do you feel sorry for him? At this point, why or why not? I'm not going to make any comment on that. I just want you to think about it. But again, I want you to think about your debating skills. Uh, why does the governor agree to take Isabella with him on the expedition? Explain fully. She lies about her age to the governor. Why do you think she does that? What would you have done if it were you? And I want you to think about the, that section in the story, what she says and what else you might think about her behavior because remember not everything is always written for you in the book a lot of it is left for you to infer isabella makes an observation about a butterfly in the governor's mansion um right at the end of the chapter what makes this observation so effective and is it being used as a metaphor okay and if it is being used as a metaphor what do you think it is being used as a metaphor to represent okay explain your answer that's quite a difficult question spend a bit of time thinking about it and finally, chapter nine. Stables, inscrutable, main, heroine, slats, assigned, glowered, forded, or glowered, I never know how to say that word, expanse, hillocks. Pablo doesn't seem pleased to see Isabella. Why do you think this is? Pablo suggests that Isabella should not go on an adventure because she's a girl. What do you think about this? I know that you will have opinions about that, um, quite rightly. Pablo changes his behaviour towards Isabella when she tells him to call her Gabo. Why do you think this is? It's quite noticeable that he uh, changes his demeanour, the way that he's speaking to her, the way that he's acting, because he's been quite um, rude and standoffish um at this point and i think that's all part of the the sort of the relationship that is developing between paolo and isabella that we're like growing to understand a little bit better um and he changes his behavior at this point so i'd like you to think about why but also just think more generally about what that relationship is uh, and perhaps why you think there's that sort of difference slight difference in the way that they behave with one another 
Um, imagine you are Isabella. How would you feel entering the Forgotten Territories with the governor's exhibition? Explain your opinion. Um, try and put yourself in her shoes for a little bit. Um, please try and make this as detailed as possible because I think there are lots of different um, ways that she'd be feeling. I think it's definitely mixed emotions. And then finally going back to the quote from the back of the book and uh, from the first chapter, uh, this is a sort of a final summary question for this whole section that is set in the Isle of Joya. Um, each of us carries the map of our lives on our skin in the way we walk, even in the way we grow. Based on the story so far, what do you think the significance of this quotation is? So what does it mean or why is it important in the story? Now, um, it's an important quotation. It's on the blurb on the back. It's in the first chapter. Why do you think it's there? What, based on what's happened so far, what does it mean? Why is it important? Okay, so that is the end of the questions. So here we go, back to me on full screen. Um, I hope that that was uh, useful um, to, me, to hear me sort of talk through them and give a little bit extra um, information as a part of it. Uh, please uh, put your, as I said, put your responses onto Shobi. Um, if you can do them, hand write them out. Um, you can all, you don't have to put your responses up. You can always send a picture or just make a few comments or send a few of them. Um, I don't mind, but if you can try and avoid using too much screen time with it after you've watched this video, then that'll be great. Um, obviously I know that you have to watch the videos again to, to, for, for that, but, um, you can still sort of do the work. You don't have to be looking at computers to do the work. Um, what else was I going to say? And then what I'm not going to do, uh, so this is uploading on Thursday. Um, I'm not going to upload another chapter Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, I'm going to give you some time to think about these questions and re-listen to um, the chapters that I've put up already. So um, that, you know, you've got that kind of element of suspense. But the re as I said before, the reason that I split the this, uh, questions up into these three sections is because we're in different geographical areas. So again, thinking about the fact that we're in Joya, at the first in this first section and that now we're moving into the forgotten territories okay so there's going to be a whole different shift in the narrative so i want you to just think about that whole section and because again the author has chosen to structure the book in that way for a reason um and maybe why you think that's important so i hope uh, that all makes sense obviously you're going to need to pause this video throughout so that you can um you know think about it or i will obviously also upload uh the pdf of the slides so that you've got all the questions um and and the vocabulary there and then you can just print them out so uh i hope you get on well um and looking forward to seeing your responses bye